Something there is that doesn't love a wall. Poet Robert Frost wrote in Mending Wall, great poem. San Francisco-born Frost is one of Yankee lore's premier mythologists. His mythical, mostly made-up New England continues to appeal to the descendants of Yankee settlers as he echoes family lore and legends, casting them in a nostalgic golden light. The anecdotal given poetic authenticity. But it's not real. It just feels real. City Boy Frost's assumptions on Stonewall building and country and rural life in general still capture the country's cultural imagination. Frost is the poet laureate of Yankee lore. We're now so far removed from those early days, that way of life, that folks take Frost's romantic representations for facts. But they're fiction, which would be fine, except some authorities have fashioned historical preservation policy based on those myths. And some have embraced Frost and the legends of industrious farmers creating hundreds of thousands of miles of stone walls in New England in an unbelievably short time in order to deny that the stonework of New England could have any other origin. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. I'm Mike Luoma. And as I look into our ancient stone mysteries of New England, it's surprising to discover the degree to which Yankee lore informs even New England's official archaeology. As too many state historic preservation authorities and archaeologists insist there is no basis to attribute New England stonework to anyone but colonial settlers or later sheep farmers. These authorities give Yankee lore a scientistic authority it has not earned. Archaeologist Curtis Hoffman, former president of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society and author of Stone Prayers, Native American Stone Constructions of the Eastern Seaboard, faults colleagues for this scientism regarding the stonework. As Hoffman's 2018 study showed, there are many reasons to believe some of New England's stonework predates colonial contact. And mounting evidence, much could be originally of indigenous origin. And this includes New England's fabled stone walls. The indigenous of this area built with stone, likely for ritual as well as practical reasons. We dispelled the old Indians around here didn't build with stone myth in the last Yankee lore video. But even some who concede some Cairn-like stone constructs or stone piles could be of indigenous ritual origin, can't make the leap and allow that many of New England's stone walls could also be of indigenous origin. New England's stone wall mythology is pretty deeply ingrained. Thank you, Robert Frost. And thank you, Robert Thorson, our current ages stone wall mythologist, geologist and author of Stone by Stone, The Magnificent History in New England's Stone Walls. Since its 2002 appearance, Thorson has become the authority on all things New England stone walls, quoted extensively. His articles and quotations from the book posted and reposted repeatedly over the last 20 years. Other so-called Stonewall experts, like author Susan Alport of Sermons in Stone, or ecologist Tom Wessels of Reading the Forested Landscape, often quote Thorson as their authority on stone walls. 
But the scientistic assumptions Thorson presents as science and history are based on Frost's poetry and the anecdotal recollections of old New Englanders, which are in turn colored by the concepts Frost elevated. These aren't conclusions based on evidence. It's guesswork based on anecdotes and poetry. And it does not include indigenous stonework or stone building as a possibility, except in the most dismissive way. Yet its stonewall guesswork is taken as gospel. Look up stonewall information online, and most searches lead to Thorson. Thorson originally cited those archaeologists who scientistically denied indigenous stonework. Now with Thorson's notoriety, some of those same archaeologists cite Thorson to insist the indigenous didn't build stone walls. It's gotten very circular. Beware as well to those who have done a little armchair research on stone walls by Googling. You may reveal yourself rather quickly by parroting Thorson's points. But guesswork and assumptions based on anecdotes and poetry aren't evidence. It's Yankee lore. Thanks to Frost's poetry and our culture, thanks to Yankee lore, most people think farmers built New England stone walls and stonework. When you learn that by 1900, 80 to 90 percent of New England had been stripped of trees for farming, fuel, and logging, it makes a certain sense to assume that all the old stonework we now see in the woods and forests was once part of old farms and fields. Thorson's work rhymes with Frost's poetry and echoes what some want to hear, reinforcing belief in industrious Yankee ancestors. Sheep farmers building 250,000 miles or more of stone walls in 30 years seems entirely plausible to those who lionize those old men of the soil. But the population sizes and the math makes it awfully far-fetched. Most skilled stonemasons can lay about 20 feet of dry stone wall in a day. With Sundays off, that's 120 feet a week, around 540 feet a month. And if we grant a generous building season of almost 10 months, the average skilled stonemason can build about a mile of dry stone wall a year. The suggestion is that some 250,000 miles of stone walls were built for the Merino sheep craze in about 30 to 50 years. That's at least 5,000 miles of stone wall built each year. So, at highest efficiency, it would require the labor of 5,000 skilled stonemasons each year, exclusively building stone walls for a 50-year stretch. We don't know how many thousands more unskilled or semi-skilled farmers and laborers it would take to accomplish this in a similar time frame, as it is impossible to calculate how many feet of stone wall lesser skilled laborers could produce in a set period of time. But it gives us an idea of the scope of the labor involved. How many stonemasons were there? We know today, thanks to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that there are only 9,790 stonemasons in the U.S. as of 2023. Just 70 in Vermont. And just over a thousand in Massachusetts though it's second only to California, with just over 1,500. 
we don't have labor statistics for the 1600s. The one reference we do have is Charles H. Pope's book, Pioneers of Massachusetts, from 1900, where he lists the occupations of 1725 of about 6,000 pioneers between 1620 and 1650. Those occupations he could find record of in contemporary documents. Stonemason is not included in his list of occupations. Granted, it's an incomplete list, covering only about a third of the population, but it is a curious omission, with Pope finding no record of stonemasons working in New England from 1620 to 1650. Those who say stone walls were all built by early settlers are also pushing another myth from Yankee lore. The idea, our people came here from stone wall building country, so they began building them here. It's assumed, even academically, settlers taught indigenous people they enslaved and employed how to build with stone. Again, because we come from stone building country. But there's a simple exercise you can do to see for yourself this just isn't true. One can only build with stone where there's plenty of stone, which means stone-building country usually sat underneath the ice sheets during the last ice age, the glaciers depositing bountiful stones as they melted and retreated, leaving a surplus of building material behind. Geologists figured out how far the glaciers came south in the last ice age and charted its furthest extent called the Last Glacial Maximum. Above this line, we'll find stone-building country. Below it, wooden fences. The earliest settlers of New England most often named their new towns after where they came from in Old England. If we overlay the Last Glacial Maximum on a map of England, and begin looking at the namesake towns for the earliest New England towns, you notice immediately the majority are towns below that line. Archaeologist Vance Teedy mentioned this as part of a presentation at the Fall Conference of the New England Antiquities Research Association, NERA, in 2022, citing the work of David Bouchier from A Few Well-Chosen Words, Vance presented population figures that bore this out. But the town names alone give it away. Of the first 40 towns founded, most in Massachusetts, a few in Connecticut, a handful in New Hampshire and Rhode Island, 31 of them were named for English towns. Only one of those towns is above that line. Two are on the border. But 28 of the 31 towns are south of the last glacial maximum, well outside of stone-building country. Surprisingly, New England settlers were not stonewall-building people, despite the assumptions of Yankee lore. Unlike the first European settlers of New England, the indigenous of the northeast of what's now called North America did come from an area with abundant stones at hand for building. The Northeast was covered by ice sheets. It's a bit hard to believe that the indigenous of this area would be some of the only indigenous people in the world from a place with bountiful rock to build with who did not, isn't it? Since they came from stone-building country, None of this is to deny that there was some pretty extensive European stone wall building around New England, but we are looking at a blended stonework landscape, where about 4,000 years of documented indigenous stonework lies around and beneath 400 years of settler and farmer stonework. This makes it hard to distinguish between the two. But if you look closer, you begin to see that what Thorson and others dismiss as junk stone walls are actually made up of designs and patterns they apparently don't perceive. 
In my video on what I look for in the stones, I outline some of these designs and patterns and show how they seem to correspond to indigenous Algonquian depictions of great serpents and underwater panthers. Some of these old stone walls may have once been serpent effigies, constructed by indigenous people in the distant past. Later, as indigenous people labored for and were enslaved by settlers to build stone walls, some seem to have continued to incorporate some of these designs for a time. As we see some serpent work with stones shaped by metal tools, a European import, in 18th century foundations and stone rows, there are metal tool marks on what appears to be the head of a serpent row in the Manitou Hassanash Preserve in Rhode Island, for example. None of this denies the greatness of Robert Frost as a poet, either. He is a powerful writer, obviously. But his flawed, city-born assumptions about stone walls falling down are only true of poorly built stone walls. When built well or on bedrock, stone rows last a very long time. This stone row at Manitou Hassanash Preserve in Rhode Island has been dated to about 1530, almost 500 years old. Without the benefit of fictional, neighborly, Ritual Maintenance. But some so-called stone wall experts, with their inability or unwillingness to see the repeated designs and patterns in what they deem junk stone walls, fall back on Frost's assumptions as if they were reality, not fiction, and explain away so-called junk walls as the result of this assumed constant degradation. The assumptions of Yankee lore reinforce each other. Like Frost's poetry, they are woven into the fabric of life in New England. If we can untangle these threads, we can begin to see other possibilities, some of the earlier designs in the weave, and unravel some of the knots which tie us to a fictionalized past that often glorifies oppression and tends to erase indigenous peoples and their contributions, including stonework. I've unlearned a lot of Yankee lore in investigating, researching, and writing about our ancient stone mysteries of New England, and learned a lot about the indigenous of our area, who are still here. I hope I've encouraged you to open your mind a bit, to look at the world around you a little differently. And if you're now curious, Please check out more of the videos on the Ancient Stone Mysteries of New England YouTube channel, where I share more of this blended landscape, where at least 4,000 possible years of indigenous stonework lies around and beneath 400 years of European stonework, some of which adapted and used the work that came before it. Learn more at ancientstonemysteries.com. This blended landscape comes into sharper focus when we can see through and past the veils of Yankee lore. I'm Mike Luoma. Thank you for exploring with me. Mm -hmm.